They got their belly full. Let's all stand this afternoon. I feel like traveling on page 133. My heavenly home is bright and fair. I feel like traveling on. Door pain, door death can enter there. I feel like traveling on. Yes, I feel like traveling on. I feel like traveling on My heavenly home is bright and fair I feel like traveling on It's glittering times, the sun outshines I feel like traveling on That heavenly mansion shall be mine I feel like traveling I feel like traveling on I feel like traveling on My heavenly home is bright and fair I feel like traveling on Let others seek a home below I feel like traveling on Which flames devour or ways or flow I feel like traveling on, I feel like traveling on, my heavenly home is bright and fair, I feel like traveling on, the Lord has been so good to me, I feel like traveling I feel like traveling on, I feel like traveling on, my heavenly home is bright and fair, I feel like traveling on. He's good, amen. amen. Let's turn over to page 147 now, page 147, press along, amen. Along to glory land, extolling grace that saves the race. Press along to glory land, press along, glad soul, press along, giving out. Long to glory land. 
Here we go again. Uh, you may be seated. I'm going to ask Brother Caleb Shirley. Uh, Pastor Grace, is that right? Grace Baptist Church in Russell Springs, Kentucky. He's going to come preach for us for a little while. Amen. It's good to be here at Mary. Baptist Church. I appreciate the opportunity and appreciate this church. I, uh, I'm nervous as a polecat. <laughs> Hallelujah. You say, what's a polecat? That's a skunk. Just in case you was wondering. Hallelujah. But, uh, amen. I'm like that brother. I'm nervous. I'm going to tell a joke, and I don't typically do that. It's just, it's just dear saint of God. He and his wife were, uh, were uh, getting on up in the years, and, and he went on to be with the Lord, and he went, uh, went to the pearly gates there, and he uh, walked up to the gate, and there was a gatekeeper, and he said, sir, in order to get in here, he said, uh, you have to spell a word. He said, really? He said, yet, yeah, in order to get in here, we just got to make sure you know how to spell a word. He said, okay, what's the word? He said, the word's church. He said, well, I can spell church. He said, that's C-H-U-R-C-H. He said, amen, you get to come in. He's thankful, went in, shouting glory, hallelujah. And uh, one day he was there in glory and in heaven, and he was just kind of happened to be walking by those front gates and uh, saw his wife coming up. He said, honey, uh, did you make it? And she said, yeah. She said, I made it. He said, well, have you seen the gatekeeper yet? She said, no, I hadn't seen him. He said, so you haven't had to spell a word to get in? She said, no. He said, well, you've got to spell a word to get in here. She said, really? She said, what's the word? He said, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> Amen. Grab your Bibles. Turn to the book of 1 uh, Kings. Or 2 Kings, rather. 2 Kings. I don't, look, I like my wife better than that. I'm just saying. Uh, that brother needed to get something right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. 2 Kings. Second Kings, because I'm going to be honest, if I had to spell Czechoslovakia to get into heaven, uh, it'd be over. Hallelujah. Uh, I am, uh, again, honored to be here. I appreciate this church. appreciate Wesley, uh, Brother Wesley, uh, wanting to do something for the Lord. Amen. And uh, appreciate Brother Jack. Uh, I've always thought a lot of Brother Jack Roberts and uh, Maryville Baptist Church. Um, I'm kind of kin to him. A lot of people don't know that. But my wife is uh, from Williamsburg, Kentucky, Corbin area, and uh, that's where Brother Jack's roots come out of. And as a young man, I got to go over and see the cabin that Brother uh, Jack uh, uh, owns over there, beautiful spot, and, and they would have youth services, and as a young man, Brother Josh uh, let me preach, and I'll just tell you, it wasn't worth a dime, amen. Uh, that was back when I was young. I was probably 15 years old and nervous. You talk about nervous, but uh, I appreciate these men of God uh, trying to be a blessing to young preachers. Amen. Amen. Uh, we, we're, losing a, we're losing a generation. I'm pretty, uh, I'm pretty burdened about my generation. Um, I was uh, speaking with Brother Josh, and he was, uh, uh, Justin, that's your name, man, Justin, sorry, brother, and, and he was talking to me about his burden. You know, uh, we're kind of the same generation there, and, and, and we're losing some men uh, to, uh, to some modern ways. And uh, I appreciate this church, appreciate Brother, Brother Jack, appreciate Brother Denny, Brother Denny Roberts. He, uh, he let me come preach for him as a young man. And uh, I, I'll just be honest with y'all, these, uh, these men of God have been a great example to me to want to know this book more. We're talking about students of God's Word. Uh, Brother Jack, I remember one time, it's, I, I, I'm not trying to embarrass Brother Jack, but you have really been a blessing. I remember one time Brother Jack was preaching for Brother Denny, a revival. And uh, I was courting Miss Heather, and uh, she was going to Brother Denny's church at the time. And, and Brother Jack was preaching, and he was uh, preaching uh, with a capital P, amen? I mean, preaching. 
and uh, boy, the Holy Ghost got in there, and it was thick, and, and he was having a time of invitation, and you know, it was one of those, let's everybody's head bowed, everybody's eyes closed, and I remember he, he, he the, apparently there was somebody in there that he knew was lost, and as a young preacher boy, I was just, I mean, I was tuned in, just watching him like a hawk, and I remember he walked over to the edge of the platform, and he said, son, look at me, and I looked up, and uh, I thought, is he talking, is he talking to me, because I'm saved, hallelujah, and, uh, and what it was, Brother Jack, is there was a boy that was lost. I can't remember his name for the life of me, but I know him. I can see him right now. And he looked up at Brother Jack. And this was a young man going to go to the military. He, you know, he was one of them. And Brother Jack, Brother Jack looked at him. He said, it's time you step up and be a man. And that boy stepped out, and he come down to an old-fashioned altar and got Amen. born again. Amen. Well, I like that stuff. Amen? Amen. I, like it. I like the real thing. Yes, I appreciate these, these men of God that has paved a way before me and showed me that it's real. And it's not something you just mess around with. And it's not, look, it's not meant for the milly mouth. Amen. It's not meant for somebody that doesn't have a backbone. It's meant for a preacher, somebody that's got some grit, somebody that wants to be and do something for God. And uh, as a young man of God and, and a young pastor, uh, I'm just going to be real honest. I feel obligated. I feel real obligated to the, to the, the path that's been paved before me. And, uh, and, and, and if God be my witness, and God help me not to, not to mess up, because ain't none of us above messing up. Say amen right there. Uh, you might have yourself convinced. You might, you might have yourself uh, deceived, if you will, but there ain't none of us better, or too good rather, to make a huge mistake in this ministry. But by the grace and by the mercy of an almighty God, friend, I don't want to drop this path that's been paved before me. I appreciate these men of God. Uh, uh, if you go here to Maryville Baptist Church, you ought to praise God that He gave you a man that loves Him and loves His book. Say amen right there. It, it, it is an honor to get to serve under God's man. And that's what I want to try to help us with this, this morning. Uh, you know, when Brother Wesley texted me, I, I didn't know whether or not I'd get the opportunity to preach, but I, I, I was taught, I, I, I was raised under a man of God that, that loved this book. You know, my, my dad was my pastor, and, and uh, that's right, I was a preacher's kid, pray for me, and, and he was a student of the book. And if you're going to preach, you need to be a student of this book. I'm going to make some statements. Look, I, I come to preach, and, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm convicted about my generation. I'm convicted about my generation of preachers. If you're going to call yourself God's man, have enough discipline to read the entire Bible. Have enough discipline to read the whole book. I mean, I'm sick and tired of men wanting to say they're preachers. And they ain't never got down and read from Genesis to Revelations. You're telling me, listen now, uh, you're telling me you're a preacher of God's Word and you don't care enough about the Word to read the whole Word? It's real quiet right now. I believe it ought not be so quiet when I'm talking about the very thing that gives us the authority to do what we do. You understand that we can't do anything that we do without this book. And if it wasn't for men that had enough backbone to tell me that there is a specific book that is God's Word, and just because it says Bible on the cover doesn't mean it's God's Word. I appreciate this right here. It, it, you need to pack you a King James. Say amen. And, and I'm thankful for men that had enough sense to study out the truth that God's Word is found in the King James. Amen? Amen. Look here, pay, pay attention. If two things are different, guess what? They're not the same. And I know that that's simple, and I know that we, we look at that as, but listen, I've, I've, I'm seeing too many of my generation abandon His Word. And it burdens me. And it breaks my heart that we had men that gave everything up that we might know that God's Word in, 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 in His true Word is only found in the King James and we ain't got the backbone to stand on that. God, help us. God, help us, young preachers. If you're wavering on the King James, look, if you're going to give up on the King James, I've heard this said, and I ain't said it, but I hope I'm okay, Brother Jack. I'm really not trying to overstep any boundaries. You are to turn in whatever ordination papers you got if they came from a Bible-believing church. Amen. 
Amen. You don't have enough self-dignity and respect that if you're going to abandon the things that's been taught you, that you are to turn them back in and have enough grace for the church that their name isn't on your ministry anymore. There's too many of us that's dropping the ball and turning to other things, and I'm burdened by it. And here in the book of 2 Kings, in chapter number, where are we? 2 Kings in chapter number 2. Uh, uh, what I'm burdened about is, is, and what I'm wanting to give you is a good example of a preacher boy. A preacher boy. Now again, I pastor my own church, and I give God praise for that. But I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like Brother Denny. Brother Denny come up to me before church. He said, they said it's a young preacher's conference. He said, but hey, I mean, you know, that, that's just kind of young preacher. That depends on your definition, right? Amen. <laughs> And uh, I'm kind of like that. Now, I am young, and I'm sure a lot of y'all would look at me as young, but I, I still think of myself as that preacher boy sitting on the third row from the front, on the, on the right side, getting my Bible open and just feeding on what God's man was giving me. Some of you preachers, preacher boys need to pay attention. If God has placed a calling on your life, then, then you need to do something with that. And right here in the book of 2 Kings, what we have is we have the testimony and the account of a man by the name of Elijah and a man by the name of Elisha. And Elisha in this story, what I want to do is I want to try to give us an example of a preacher boy, a man that was serving under God's man. So let's look at what the Bible says. Look with me at chapter 2 of 2 Kings. If you're there, say amen. amen. Look at verse 1. The Bible says this. It says, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha uh, from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came, from Eli or came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away the master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. In other words, he said, I don't want to hear it. Amen. Just, just look, if that's all you want to talk about, then don't talk. Amen. Hold your peace is what he said. And Elijah said unto him, or unto uh, uh, Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, as I so liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha, said unto him, Knowest thou not, uh, or knowest thou, the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? Uh, and he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee, hear, uh, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men uh, of the sons of the prophets went and stood, uh, stood to view afar off, and they stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, wrapped it together, and smote the waters that were divided hither and thither, uh, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when Elijah, or when they were gone over, that Elijah and Elisha, or said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee. Uh, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it will be so unto thee. Be, uh, but, if, but if not, uh, it shall not be so. Let's have a quick word of prayer if that's okay. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this great opportunity. And Lord, uh, I just want to do your will. And God, I didn't come here today with my best outline. God, I didn't come here today with my most recent outline. Uh, but God, by whatever uh, I can muster up in spiritual discernment, Lord, I know I'm nothing. But Lord, I came, Lord, seeking to do your will if you'd have it uh, through me. And Lord, you've given me this opportunity, Lord, and I pray you'd put, a, 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 Lord, a hedge of protection. Lord, I know that if it's up to me, I'm going to say something wrong. God, if it's left up to me, Lord, I'm going to say something, Lord, that's going to hurt somebody's feelings that wouldn't be according to your will and your word. But God, I pray desperately, Lord, that you would fire, Lord, uh, 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 Lord, I pray that you'd uh, uh, blow in the fire that you've been kind of uh, spreading in my heart, God, regarding this generation of preachers. And Lord, I, it's my desire to help God spread that fire if I can. And Lord, try to be a help to maybe a young man that's 
thinking about jumping ship, Lord, or maybe his eyes are off on the wrong things in his ministry. And Lord, I just pray you'd use this time for your honor and your glory. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here in this passage, again, what I believe we can, we can glean is a good truth regarding a preacher boy. Uh, and so what I want to do is I just want to try to preach a little while on some lessons from a preacher boy. Uh, uh, again, Brother Wesley, when he sent me uh, a text and when I saw, I believe a flyer was made, it said Young Preachers Conference, and, uh, uh, or fellowship rather, and again, and, and immediately I began to think, well, Lord, I'm going to try to go if I can. You know, as a pastor, you've got some things and obligations, but Lord worked it out where I could be here. And so then my prayer was, God, I, I don't want to just come with a good outline. Again, I, I don't want to just come with something that's been fresh or, or good at my church. Lord, I want to preach exactly uh, what you'd have me to. I want to give them something, Lord, that comes from you and not what I want to preach. And and the Lord began to deal with me, and he began to, uh, uh, I believe, maybe, you know, again, <laughs> I don't believe in, the, uh, in receiving the audible voice of God right now in this dispensation. Uh, I wish I had a red phone that sat beside my bed. Bro, Jack, what about you? And as a preacher, when I've got to preach, I could just grab that red phone and say, all right, Lord, can you give me the exact message? Boy, that'd be nice, wouldn't it? But as, as God's man, and from my heart, I promise, I don't have that. And so I just do my best to discern and pray and try to, I try to ask God and believe and trust that what, what I'm, the direction I'm heading in is the direction He's leading me. You know, that's what the book says. And I, I'm, just, I'm just crazy enough to say that I believe whatever the book says. Amen? It says that if you acknowledge Him, that He'll direct your path. And that's what I'm trying to do this morning. I'm trying to acknowledge Him. And I believe, friend, I believe that it be God's will for me as a younger man of God, as as a younger preacher, uh, to try to help uh, uh, encourage some of my peers. Amen? Uh, we've, been, we've been given a great opportunity to be something in this day and age. Amen? If we live in dark days, sure. We live in some days where it's pitch black in a lot of areas. You know, back in my hometown where I'm from, I've got a, a friend of mine goes there, and he teaches in the school system, and, and he was telling me just the other day, he said, Caleb, he said, it, it's almost like that it is the popular thing if you get to be a part of the sodomite crew. Yep. He said, they look at you like you're better nowadays. Yep. And you know, and I, I gradu- it wasn't too long ago I graduated. And there was, some, there was some young people that I was in school with that, that I kind of thought was going that way. And we even got word that they were going that way. Well, nowadays, I mean, you're looking at 10 or 20 young people right. that have come out full-fledged of the closet and wanting to propagate this message that you need to, you need to go and, and you need to uh, uh, explore what you are in this life. God help us, these are some dark days. Right. But that does not mean, listen, hey, that does not mean that our generation of preachers should ease up or that we should lighten up or that we should take it easier on them. By the grace of an almighty God, listen to me, in darker days your light should shine brighter, friend. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid that we're abandoning our men of God and going our own way. And it sickens me. It sickens me. You know what I'm tired of, Brother Jack? I'm tired of these young preachers wanting to look at things that we were taught and say, well, you ain't got no Bible for that. Now, I'm a Bible believer. Say amen right there. But I'm also, I've got a little bit of a brain. I don't act brilliant. I don't act like I'm a genius. But I've got a little bit of of brain. And what I've noticed is when they, start, when they start singing that tune, guess what that means? They're going to eventually start crossing the Bible. They're going to abandon the King James. They're going to abandon that old-time music and old-time way. They're going to abandon the, uh, the dressing of separation. Amen. I mean, that's, listen, when they start singing that tune, they might be right on some of those things, but all they're trying to do is soften you up so that when they do cross over, that you ain't as mad at them over it or whatever. And I say, hey, let's stop abandoning such things and let's start holding them up and staying right because there's been men that gave up everything for that. There's been, listen, there's been Bible-believing preachers that gave up uh, 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 platforms and gave up notoriety. Why? Because they did what they believed was right according to the Scriptures. It wasn't popular. It was listen, it wasn't so that they could get more meetings. It's because they were doing it to impress God and Him alone. 
And Elisha, you know what Elisha did? Elisha stayed with his man. And he didn't abandon his man. Even when they told him, you might as well abandon your, your man of God. He stuck with him and stayed right there with him no matter what. God helped some of us young preachers to have enough grit to get back behind our preacher and support him in everything that he's doing. Hallelujah. Number one, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice the unity of God's men. I do find it interesting that all of these prophets had the same, or understood the same thing. And I think that's important. I think there's some stuff to glean from that. I believe there's something to glean for the fact that all of them was in unity about that they knew that God was going to be taking Elijah. I believe they was getting it from the same source. I said I believe they was getting it, friend, from the same source. You can take you another version of that book right there, and you can find that, that according to that, that book, that in this dispensation of grace that you can lose your salvation. I said you can take another version and you can prove that. You can take another version and you can prove, listen to me, that you must be baptized to be regenerated. I said you can take another version of this book that's not this book, it's different, you see, because it's a different source. And you can, listen, you can teach heretical doctrine. Why? Because it ain't the same source. There's something wrong with you if you can't submit to the right source. I'm a firm believer that this book, this book is God's Word and that there's a copy of it over in glory. Are you listening to me? This is not a book written by a man. This is not a book written by some dude that thought it was right. This is inspired, given by inspiration of an almighty God for us. I believe in this book. I believe in the Holy Ghost, friend. I believe that, listen, if we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth, that spiritually speaking, that we'll not be, we'll not be going in opposite directions, that, that we'll not be contradicting one another. I remember this one time, there's a, a man over there where I'm from, I'm kin to him, there he goes to my dad's church, and, and he was working as a custodian for a little while there at, uh, at Green County High School. And, and when I was in school, he, he went over to this FCA club meeting, and, and I'm going to be honest with y'all, when I was in school, I'd go to those meetings every once in a while, but I didn't hook up with them because they wasn't right. Wow. Amen. And so when I went in, and he was talking to me, and he said, did you get to go to the FCA club meeting? I said, no, I didn't go today. He said, well, that's probably for the better. I said, why is that? He said, they had a concert today. I said, did they? Anything called a concert, I don't even want to be at much. Amen. Amen. Um, that just sounds like a party to me. And uh, I, 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 I'm going to steer away from that junk. And I said, a concert? I said, what happened? He said, well, he said, they brought a rock man in here and they were singing something. He said, as a matter of fact, a brother asked me, he said, he said, did you not feel something on that music? He said, well, I told him. I said, yeah, I felt something. He said, the same thing I felt when I used to listen to them ACDC concerts. Right. He said it was the same thing I felt at those ACDC concerts. Why? Because listen to me. There's a difference in the spirituality of that stuff. Are you listening? There's a difference. There's a difference. And we need to be getting it from the same source. And the Holy Ghost is not within a million miles of that wickedness. I had a boy tell me one time I graduated, he was, he was getting on to me and, and uh, Brother Zach, a friend of mine, he goes to my church, he's a preacher there and, and, uh, and he was getting on to us about our standards and we was trying to be a blessing to him and, and we was trying to influence him and he said, look boys, he said, I believe in a transcendent God. I mean, that sounds great at face value. He said, my God transcends things. He said, he transcends all music. He, says, I, was, he said, I was running this morning, he said, I was listening to some uh, uh, some uh, Conway or Kanye, uh, Kanye, uh, some kind of rapper. He said, and I felt the Holy Spirit. I said, look, brother, you felt the Spirit, but it was not the Holy Spirit. Because that's not the same source. These prophets was getting their message from the same source. Amen. We need to be making sure that what we get it from comes from the right source. Same source, same selflessness. Same spirit. Number two, we saw the unity of God's man. Number two, I want you to notice the upholding of his goodly master. And I'm probably going to end it here. I want you to notice that Elisha was dedicated to his man of God. His man of God told him, tarry here. Those other prophets two times told him, you might as well just abandon him. And he would not do so. I've got a problem with young preachers that don't scotch for their man of God. You say, Scotch, what's that mean? That's, 
That's a southern term. I, I, I heard that used down in Tennessee preaching here and there. Scotch, how many of y'all was raised on a farm? And they'd say, Scotch them wheels right there. And what that meant is you'd take a block of something or a rock, and when, that, when they'd stop that vehicle, whatever it was, wagon, you'd put that right behind that wheel so that it didn't back up. Right. We need some preacher boys Amen. that when God's man goes to preaching, that every time he moves forward, you scoot up right behind him so that he don't back up. I said, we need some preacher boys that when God's man goes to preaching, that you scoot right up in there behind them and you go to scotching for him so that he knows that you're for him and he don't have to back up because you've got his back, friend. I've heard it said like this. I was raised this way uh, 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 under the preaching that I was raised under that if I didn't have enough grit to back up my preacher and the scot while, scotch while he was preaching, then I didn't have the right to stand in his pulpit at any time. We need some young men to be, listen, you need to pay some dues. I said you need to pay some dues. Listen, if you ain't, if you ain't, if you ain't got the grit, if you ain't got the wherewithal to work in your, your man of God's field, what makes you think God should give you a field? We want, we want the accolades. We want, we want our face on the flyer. Say amen. 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 We want our face on the flyer. We want to be the premier uh, speaker at some kind of conference. Hey, preacher boy, where are you at when it's bus ministry visitation? Where are you at when it's church cleaning day? Where are you at when the preacher has been slaving and working to study and he needs a young man to be here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night to encourage him when he's preaching? We need some preacher boys. Listen, we need some preacher boys that do not abandon their man of God. You don't know the blessing of having Brother Jack Roberts here at Maryville Baptist Church. You don't know, you don't know the miracle that Brother Jack Roberts has been here at Maryville Baptist Church all this time preaching it right and not backing up. And God forbid a preacher boy here not be in his spot every single time the doors is open. God forbid you don't get in on some type of ministry here. You know what we got? We got to get a lot of preacher boys with an announcement but no evidence. I'm about sick of, look, this might cross y'all. And Brother Jack, if I say anything wrong, call me down. And I mean that. I'm about sick of announcements. And that's it. Our churches are filling up with preachers that's got an announcement. It's on Facebook. It's on Twitter. They've got a video of them coming up before the church and saying, God's called me to preach. And all they're doing, all they're doing is sitting on a pew. And when they're at home, they ain't doing any good at home. And listen to, they ain't studying, they ain't praying, and they ain't serving in their church in whatever capacity they can. And where I come from, it's called sorry as kyarn. Amen. They call you a deadbeat, friend. Wouldn't hit a lick at nothing. Hallelujah. You know what you want? You want a ministry and you want God to serve it to you on a platter. You don't look, you don't want to pay your dues. You don't want to do what it takes to be God's man, but you want to be God's man. God help this sorry and weak and milly lipped generation that I've been raised around. It's it's you know what it is? It's weak. And if you're if you're if you've got enough backbone, God help you to stand up and make an announcement, you better start showing some proof. Showing some proof. When I announced my call to preach, I had, by the grace of an almighty God, had some men that looked me in my God-given eyeball. And they said, all right, son, you want to step up to the plate? They said, have you count the cost? Have you count the cost? Are you willing? Are you willing, they said, to do what it takes to be God's man? I've preached in adult daycares. I've preached in boys' homes. Went to a boys' home one time, preached this boy. He had an eyebrow son that grew plumb up to his hairline. And it was weird. And I said, what's wrong with that boy? And this is where God started helping me, started working on me. He's inbred. Got to preaching to him. Got to telling him the gospel of an almighty Jesus that came and died for his sins. Listen, and I didn't have a piano player. And I didn't have a pulpit. And I didn't have my best suit on. But I was sitting in an old house over in Sonora, Kentucky. And I was preaching to some boys the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they had never heard of such things. Man, they were starting to ask questions like, what movie is this on? Can you see this stuff on Disney? I said, no, friend. I said, Disney couldn't come out with anything this good, neighbor. Hallelujah. And got to preaching to some boys and seeing them get born again. Went into a jail cell, started preaching to some women. In a prison, preaching to women. Now, that's just weird. 
Say amen if you preach in prison. That ain't no place for a lady. And I started talking to them about their babies and how, how it's a shame that we've got women in prison and them babies need somebody to raise them. Went in there and preached to some men one time. Got done, had an invitation. I said, how many of y'all's lost? Not one of them raised their hand, brother. I'm talking about a prison full. I said, what about that? I said, we got a prison full of Christians. I said, boy, it's a shame. Started seeing hands pop up. Yeah, there was some lost people in there. Learned to preach. Well, I paid some dues because I had some men of God that had enough sense and loved me enough to tell me, son, get your hind end off that pew, go find your pulpit, and start preaching. Your announcement's not going to get your face on no flyer. And it ain't even about no stinking flyer. Well, I thank God for the men that get their face on flyers. That means they've done something. But listen, to, that ain't got nothing to do with what preaching's about. It's about seeing some souls safe. It's about holding a standard. It's about being something in your generation. And look here, young preachers. If you're going to be something, get behind your man of God. And care enough about the stuff that he's preaching to learn it. I said care enough about the stuff he's preaching to learn it. Hold on to every word. God forbid Brother Jack Roberts preach somewhere local and his preacher boys ain't sitting on the front row. Right. Because if that church ain't going to scotch for him, you will. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Boy, I'm thankful for my man of God. They, they held, that he, he held up his goodly man. He didn't change God's man. He stayed with him. He didn't change on his feelings. He didn't change on his faith. He didn't change on his fellowship. And I'm going to close right here. I know I had a yellow light and done went back green. Y'all must like that preaching. Amen. <laughs> Listen to me and I'm, I'm done. I'm going to close here. I'm going, to close on, I'm going to close on the request made. I'm going to close on the request made by that preacher boy. He said, I want a double portion, Brother Jack. Yeah. Now, let me say something. <clears throat> I kind of had a misconception of that. Yeah. But you know what I was taught? I was taught to study God's Word. And I was, I was taught not to just take it like, like you know, it, it hits me, but to go a little deeper. You know what? I, you've heard this preach, and it's right. You know, that Elijah, he had uh, uh, about 14 miracles he got to be a part of. And when you study the scriptures, you'll see that Elisha had 28. And that Elisha had twice the portion. But that wasn't what Elisha was asking for. Listen to me. Elisha was not asking to be two times the man that Elijah was. You see, there was a bunch of prophets standing over on that hillside. Ain't that what it says? You know what Elisha knew? He knew that the spirit on that man of God was going to be divided up between all of us prophets. That's, in, that's what he thought in his mind, friend. And he said, what's left behind from you, Elijah? I want two times every single one of them get. That's what his request was. You see, that was, uh, think about it like this. When a man died and he had, he had a, an inheritance that he left for his children, a lot of times that firstborn would get that double portion from what that second born would get. Do you understand the economy I'm trying to describe here? Elisha had, listen to me, Elisha had such high regard for Elijah, he would have never dreamed that he would have got two times the ministry that Elijah had. Are you listening to me? It, it would have never crossed his mind that God would have given him twice the ministry of Elijah. But he said, I want a double portion. Let me, let me help you all with something. That's exactly right. God's man in your life ought to be held in that regard. But pay attention to me. Don't let him trickle over into the God of the man. Did you hear me? Don't let God's man get in the way of the, man, the God of the man. And that, that, that might have been, if, listen, if I could say anything about Elisha, Elisha might have got to that point in some regards. Because in his mind, he could never get any more than a double portion of, of being that firstborn, like Brother Jack just said. But listen to me. Uh, what we forget is that we serve a God that called that man of God that you've been given, that put on his heart and put on his mind the message that you've been blessed to hear. And if God can do that for him, friend, listen to me, young preacher boy, God can do that for you. God can be more for you than he's ever been for anybody. The Bible still says that he can do abundantly above all that we ask or think. In his mind, he would have never dreamed that he could have twice the ministry. And God did that for him anyways. Why? Because that's the God 
that we serve. And might I add, young preachers, my peers, I hope to God you haven't looked at me like I think I'm better than you. I know I'm not. I'm a preacher's kid. They're the worst. Amen, don't you know? Amen. Thank you, Brother Denny. Bearing witness, brother. Amen. I got whooped just for looking cross because I knew, or because they knew that I was sorry as yarn. Amen. I hope you realize I'm not looking down at you. I'm looking right at you and saying, hey, let's pick up the mantle. That's what Elisha did. He picked up the mantle. He picked up that mantle and did the same thing. And guess what he found out? The same thing that that mantle did by the touch of God's, his God. God did the same thing for him. Listen to me. Listen to me, young preachers. Listen to me. Pick up your Bible. Stop looking for your face on a stinking flyer. Amen. Look here. If you ain't willing to work in your, in your pastor's field, don't think God's going to give you a field. Get busy at your church. There's a bus ministry that goes on around here. There's plenty of visitation that goes on around here. And there's some cleaning that goes on around here. And you need to be found doing something other than just trying to preach in a platform. Go to a nursing home. Go to a street corner. Go to a boy's home. Go to the bus ministry. Ask them if you can preach. You let everybody know, listen, if you need help teaching, preaching something, I'm your guy. Just call me. I don't understand. There's probably some young preachers that should be here right now that I I don't get a young preacher don't want to preach. My dad's philosophy was this. He'd look at us preacher boys. I was raised around a bunch. <clears throat> and I'm amazed at the ones that didn't turn out. I don't know why they had an announcement, had no evidence. My dad would say this to him. They'd come up to him, Brother Zach, you testify. They, we come, they'd come up to him, and, and I, I went up to him, and I said, Dad, I believe I'm called to preach. You know what he said? No, you ain't. What? Why would he say that? Because if he could talk you out of it, you wouldn't. Because all you want is an announcement. All you want is the accolades. All you want is to be lifted up. God forbid we got some preacher boys in here that ain't serving and being something for their church. Let's bow our heads. I'll say a word of prayer. Brother Wesley, go ahead and make your way up here. Heavenly Father, we we'll thank you for this great opportunity. Lord, I appreciate this good church. Thank you for Brother Jack and his uh, influence on me, God. Thank you for the services I've been in on here at Maryville, God, where the Holy Ghost went to stirring. And people went to shouting and running and crying. Lord, I'm thankful for the right way. And Lord, God forbid that I abandon what I've been taught, that I abandon, Lord, the path that was paved before me. Lord, help me to have enough backbone. Help me to be fearless, Lord, towards the world, but to have a fear and a reverence for you and the importance of holding up the truths, God, that you've placed, Lord, before me. Lord, I love you. It sure is good to be saved. And I pray, Lord, if it be your will, if there's a young preacher here that wasn't settled, well, I pray you'd settle him today. Pray you give him some unction. Pray you give him some of that anointing that's been preached on. Lord, we need them. We need a generation to come up, Lord, around us. And if we don't, Lord, we're going to lose some things. God, I pray you'd help us not to do that. We love you, for it is in the precious and holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Wesley. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Okay. I want the alleys to come up here and get ready to sing. I just want to echo a little bit of what... Brother Caleb just said, I've said this to my Sunday school class, it hasn't been too long ago. Uh, and I just talked to our church here for just a minute. This is just for Maryville. I don't know if you know this or not, uh, but Jack Roberts is not going to live forever. You know, I, I hope you're aware of that. Uh, he's not. He's not going to be around forever. And uh, somebody's going to have to step up. Hey, Amen. Tell you One of the greatest blessings in my life. I don't know if I can get it out or not. One of the greatest blessings in my life has been kneeling down right next to Jack Roberts while he's praying. Hear him call out my name. Hear him call out my children's name. Hear my, my cousins. Jack Roberts dies, who's going to pray for him? Somebody's going to have to. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Who, who's going to step up and fill that place in yeah. your family? I can tell you about mine. Who's going to step up and fill that place in your family? Right. Who's going to pray for your children? Right. 
You gonna leave that up to somebody else? Oh my. Oh my. That was good, Brother Cave. I, I enjoyed that. Amen. I like that. Amen. Alan, y'all sing. Thank you. Chapter 6. dawn of time my friend death was the price for sin he took the lamb without spot and without blame but the blood of the lamb couldn't save men's sin so he sent his savior down for me that day the shepherd gave his life for the sheep and I walked out of sin's prison with my chains set free I don't have to pay sin's awful penalty for the shepherd gave his life the wrath of God was satisfied Guilty was my plea. The old accuser said, Why me? But the very law of God said I was lost as I could be. But the Lamb of God came to shine a light, just like a beacon in a cold, dark night. That day, the shepherd gave his life. Just for me And I walk out of sin's prison With my chains he set free I don't have to pay sin's awful penalty For the shepherd gave his life The wrath of God was sad Beside the gates of heaven, waiting to go in. And he wondered how this holy place could take a man like him. With shouts of great rejoicing, and with music winds they came. Of the angels standing by him, he asked what could be their names. The are the company prophets, the goodly fellowship of souls, who knew our Lord and walked beside Him, who blessed the poor and made the wounded whole, and oh, He fell upon His knees. I am not one of these. He waited till another band of shining ones drew nigh. They entered into heaven with a hallelujah cry. He asked again, who are these? Can you tell me whence they came? Of the angels standing by him, he asked what could be their names. Well, these are the company of martyrs, the saints who contended for their faith, who knew our Lord and walked beside him, who ran the holy race and did not 
God faints, and oh, he fell upon his knees, and he cried, I am not one of these. Then suddenly a multitude was heard from far away, their voices rang with songs of joy, the redeemed David, Mary, Magdalene, and Paul, but the thief who died by Jesus was the one who led them all. Who are these? He almost shouted at the angels. These are the sinners saved by Justified by faith, and oh, he leaped up from his knees. I can go in with these. I can go in. Yes, I can go in. I've been washed in the blood. Everlasting life. Hands. One day I'll live forever there, 
singing today, but sometimes you just do what you told. You've been my life for so long, Lord, you were right, and I was wrong. I
You saved my soul, forgave my sin, and set me free. Now when I stumble, I'm about to fall. You always answer. When I call, Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I owe it all to you, Lord. All I have is yours, Lord. Take my life. Make it what you'd have it be. I'm your child and you're my father. Lord, I'm the clay and you're the pot. ever happened to me. Well, it's been good. I got good news. It ain't over yet. There's still time to get in on this if you need to. They might. Amen. I, I sure am glad we have this meeting. Amen. 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 Uh, I'm gonna, we're going to have one more preacher and we'll be done today. Uh, I, I tell you how I feel, fellas. Uh, let me say something kind of from the perspective. Brother Caleb just preached. I mean, I really I appreciate that, Brother Caleb. It's a good message. But uh, not from looking down on you, uh, but. Being eye level with you, young preachers, we I feel like we've had our fun today. And I've enjoyed listening to you preach. And uh, we've got to stand up and talk and say things. Uh, but I believe this is one of those times uh, where we close our mouths and we sit down and we listen and learn. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask my uncle, uh, Denver Roberts, pastor of Star Baptist Church in Williamsburg, Kentucky, to come close out the meeting. Uh, I thought all day something good to say about him before I called him up, and I couldn't think of anything. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's, a, that's our relationship, I think, anyway. Uh, we pick at each other. That's how we know we're not mad at each other. At least that's what I'm doing. He might really be mad at me. I'm not sure. All right. Um, <laughs> he said he don't get mad. He gets even. Um, I mean, he's not lying, neither. Uh, no, I will, I will tell you something uh, about my uncle that I do admire very much. I don't say this because he's my uncle. Uh, I, I did, I tell you what kind of preachers I like. I like the kind of preachers that the more you're around them and the more you get to know about them, the more you like them. I know a whole lot of them that I've heard preach and I thought, man, that was good. And then you learn a little bit about their life and you think, well, it really wasn't that good, was it? But I like them ones that it's real. And if I could say, I, I, spent a, I spent a short period of time, uh, not real long, but I spent a few months, and I lived in this man's home. And uh, I'm, I'm here to tell you, the thing I admire most about my uncle, Denny Roberts, is that whether he's in his pulpit or he's in his recliner, he's the same man. Hey, man you listen to him as he preaches. Caleb, they before you run off, they said there's some water in that back room. I told Caleb my talking before this thing started this morning. I said, I saw this thing on Facebook, said Young Preachers Fellowship. And I didn't figure I was invited because I ain't been young in a long time. Uh, then my, <coughs> then my, I'm going to tell on him, you <coughs> My nephew called me, Wesley called me a few days after that, and he said, I want to invite you to our Young Preachers Fellowship. I didn't say anything, because I really didn't know what to say. And he said, yeah, I know what I said to you, but I want you to come anyway. <clears throat> and then uh, Thursday, he called me Thursday night. 
He said, are you coming? And I said, yeah, I'm going to come. Plan on being up there. And he said, well, I want you to close the meeting out. Actually, what he said when I first answered the phone was, he said, you're being called up to the big leagues. <laughs> he said, I need you to close the meeting out Saturday. And uh, actually, I, I don't guess he cares for me telling this, but Brother Kenan Roark was supposed to be here today, but he's preaching a funeral. A lady in his church passed away. And uh, they planned on Brother Kenan closing out the meeting, which would have been fine with me. But I hung up the phone, and this thought occurred to me. He must think I'm some minor league preacher to tell me I'm being called up to the big leagues. And I thought what I ought to do is leave about 10 minutes before he's going to call me to pulpit to preach and put him in his place. But anyway, fellas, I want to tell you I've enjoyed the preaching today. All you young preachers, it's all been good. Uh, I can tell you from the standpoint of being an older preacher, at least I know when I'm gone, there still still be some people standing. I've got grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I'm thankful to know that when I'm gone, there'll still be some folks around to tell them the truth. And it's been a blessing for me just to be here today to hear the ones who got to preach. Uh, I know Brother Caleb talking about folks that's left the way. I got news for it's not just your generation, it's mine too, Brother Caleb. One of my favorite preachers many years ago put his King James Bible down when got him an NIV. And I told some folks I used to drive 150, 200 miles to go sit and listen to him preach, and now I wouldn't walk across the road if he's in the, in the house across the road from me. I'm not giving up the book, and I'm not fooling with people that do. But I, I thought about several things about today, and I don't have all the answers, men. You young preachers are going to make some mistakes. I said mistakes. You don't have to fall into sin, but you're still going to make some mistakes in the ministry. Uh, and uh, I hope maybe what I say today will be a help to you. Whether you're just getting started, maybe you're not even, uh, you may not be pastoring a church. You may just be preaching here and there, whatever opportunities you can find and, and it's been made available to you. But somewhere down the road, you'll have a ministry, whatever that is. When it's all said and done, one day you'll stand before God and give an account of the ministry you're given. I'm going to try to preach this afternoon as we close out this service on this thought, a ministry worth having. If i got your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 1. The Apostle Paul, outside of Jesus Christ, the greatest preacher that ever walked the face of the earth, in my, in my opinion, was the Apostle Paul. And he writes two letters to a young preacher named Timothy. He writes another letter to a young preacher named Titus. And uh, gives some instructions. And uh, if you, when you find your place, I'll ask you to stand, let you stretch your legs. Uh, they've, turned the, they've turned the traffic light off, which means you'll go home when I get done. And since I've got a three-hour trip to where I live at, if I have to drive it, well, the one brother probably got farther drive than I, than I do. Sorry, Brother Simpson, you'll just, you just have to live through it this afternoon. I, I'll not be real long, but I hope to be a help to you young men who've answered the call to preach. Already preaching. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, verse 1, by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. To do, uh, so do, excuse me. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, of a good conscience, and of a faith unfeigned, from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling. In case you wonder what that phrase means, a bunch of preachers don't know what's up from what's down, and they get up and waste about 40 minutes of your time, and you go home no better off than when you went. Okay? Uh, 
Let's try to avoid that, men. Let's not waste folks' time, especially God's time. But it says, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm, but we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind. That's been mentioned two or three times today. If you ain't figured out what that is, that's the sodomite crowd. All right? Uh, for men-stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust, look at verse 12, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Lord, we love you this morning, uh, this afternoon. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. Lord, we thank you for... Lord, for the preaching that's been done. Lord, it's been good. It's been good for all of us. Uh, Lord, we've, we've, we've gotten some help today, even for ourselves. God, we're thankful that the Word of God uh, is uh, able to help any and all who will just pay attention to it. And this afternoon, we ask that you help us. Lord, as we stand here before uh, this group of people, but uh, especially before these young preachers who are getting started uh, in the ministry in some way, and may we be a help to them that uh, when it's all said and done, they'll be able to stand before you at the judgment seat with their head held high, saying, I did my best to do what God would have me to do. Go with us now, lead us and guide us. Forgive us for our sins, for our shortcomings. Go with us uh, as we travel our way home this afternoon. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. The Apostle Paul spent a lot of time in his uh, letters to the different churches talking about preaching. Uh, matter of fact, uh, in 1 Corinthians 1.18, said he says, For the preaching of the cross, <clears throat> for the preaching of the cross, to them that perish is foolish, just but to the, us that believe it is the power of God and salvation, right? Uh, and then he said uh, a little later on, about four or five verses later there, and by the way, fellas, if you think you're just nervous just because you're young, it don't ever get any easier and it don't ever get no better. All right. He said, uh, for the preaching of the cross, uh, to the, uh, we preach Christ crucified. I'll get it out right in a minute. Uh, verse 123 of 1 Corinthians, for uh, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. But then he said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Amen. Right? Huh? Hey. Uh, woe unto me, Paul said. The greatest preacher outside of Christ himself who ever walked the face of the earth said, Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. And, and other places, and I'll not take time. Uh, they didn't put me on a time limit, but I'm not going to keep you forever, honestly. Uh, but uh, all, Paul's all the time talking about preaching. But when he writes to young Timothy, he's not so much worried about the preaching as he is the ministry. I'm going to tell you, I've, uh, I've, I've been uh, pastoring, I'm on my second church uh, for a total of about 13 years now, 12 or 13. I've stopped figured up. My math's not real good most of the time. Uh, but the fact is, uh, I discovered a long time ago when I first got into pastoring the church, if all I had to do was preach, I'd be in pretty good shape. It's the rest of the stuff that'll kill you. Uh, I, I, uh, listen. Uh, it, it, all the other things, if I could just spend time reading and praying and studying and being ready to preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and somebody else would take care of the other affairs of the church, I'd be real pleased. Huh? But some, sometimes they just things that a man has to do uh, when he's put in, in that kind of position. But Paul's talking to Timothy about the ministry. Uh, matter of fact, uh, he writes to Timothy, uh, about the ministry here in verse 12. He said, I thank God he counted me faithful to put me into the ministry. In 2 uh, Timothy chapter uh, 4, he said, uh, not, yeah, I believe that's where it's at. He said, make full proof of thy ministry, right? In the book of Colossians chapter 4, verse 17, he writes to a man, young man named Archippus, and that's my best pronunciation. If you can do better, have at it. To fulfill the ministry that thou hast been given. And by all indications, that man was the pastor of the church at Colossus. And so uh, there are some things about the ministry 
uh, that one of these days you're going to have to give an account for. Right? Not just, uh, and, and I'll get into uh, most of it here in a minute, but listen, uh, the fact is, when God gives you a ministry, I, I made this statement down in Tennessee the 1st of March, if you ain't real careful, God can take the ministry He gave you and give it to somebody else. Right. Right. Paul said, I, I'm thankful God counted me faithful to put me into the ministry. He didn't have to use you, by the way. I'm talking to all of us right there. He didn't have to use you. Okay? Uh, but uh, he, he starts talking about the ministry. And I, I got a couple of things I want to give you by way of introduction. Uh, and I hope to be a help to you, first of all. And it's been mentioned a couple of times by the other preachers. But there, is a, there must be an acknowledgement of the call upon your life. Now, now be real careful right there. Uh, Brother Caleb's talking about it. Folks like to make an announcement, and that's as far as they go. I know a fellow that sells used cars Monday through Saturday. Preaches on Sunday. And I heard a fellow ask him, why do you sell cars? He said, because I have to eat. Well, why do you preach? I can't help it. That's what he told the fellow. I can't help it. I'm going to tell you, if God puts a call on your life, you'll find a place to preach. You won't, be begging, you won't be begging the pastor to let, me in, let you in his pulpit. You'll find a place to preach. Hey, uh, there, there's the acknowledgement of the call. Matter of fact, uh, let me tell you something, fellas. Preaching is a calling. It's not a career choice. I spent 26 years in the military. I had a chaplain when I was at Fort Knox, when I first got transferred into Fort Knox, and I got to talking to him. And he said, he said, I think as quick as my uh, term's up with the military, I'm getting out and I'm going to go do something else. And I said, why is that? And he said, I thought preaching was just a three-hour-a-week job. He said, I swore pastor the church I'd only have to work three hours a week and I could play golf the rest of the time. I told him, I said, fella, if you can find a church where you only have to work three days a week to pastor it, let me know. I know 10,000 Baptist preachers that will line up to take it. Preaching and pastoring is a calling. It's not a career choice uh, to pad your pocket and make sure you got a retirement when you get old. Matter of fact, I'll be honest, I've, I've studied the Bible from front to back a few times, and I'm trying to figure out where the retirement is for this thing outside of over there. I ain't found a place this side of eternity that we're supposed to retire. There's, there's the, there's the acknowledgement of the call that must be made. Matter of fact, uh, the Apostle Paul used the word here in 1 Timothy 1 that he was an apostle by the commandment of God. In Romans and 1 Corinthians, he said he was called by God. It's the same thing. But it's a calling. I, I got a young boy, he was supposed to come this morning, really intended to, and, and some things got in the way. A young preacher in my church, he came to me about two years ago, I guess it was. And he said, I think, uh, he said, I think I'm supposed to be a preacher. And I said, why? First thing I did is tell him, you don't want nothing to do with this. I did. I did everything in the world to discourage him. Some of you folks are looking at me funny. Ask any of these other fellows that's been around as long or, or longer than I have about what they do when some young man comes and says, I think I'm supposed to be a preacher. You know what I was told? Find something else to do. But he came to me and he said, I think I'm supposed to be a preacher. And I said, okay. I said, this is what I, I want you to answer one question. Tell me why you'd want to get involved in preaching. He said, okay, let me think about it. Now, he thought I was trying to trick him. I wasn't. Honestly, I wasn't. In about two weeks, I got a text from him. I think I'm need to be a preacher because everybody needs to hear the gospel. And I sent him a text back and I said, I got news for you. You don't have to be a preacher to carry the gospel to folks. That's not the right reason. About two weeks later, he sent me another text. Well, I think this. And I sent an answer back. This went on for about six months. One day I was working around the church and he come in. At the time he was working second shift, he come in one Tuesday afternoon. Me and some men were working. He said, he said, I got to talk to you. So I got, we got off in a room by ourselves, and I said, what's going on? He said, that question you asked me, he said, he said I'm going to tell you. He
He said, I ain't figured out the answer you're looking for. He said, but God's all over me, and if I don't preach, I'm going to be in trouble with him. I said, that's the answer I've been looking for to begin with, son. When God puts it on you, you can't help it. So the first thing you're going to have to do is acknowledge and accept the call that's been placed there. Secondly, I want you to notice that you're accountable because of the charge that's given to you. Every Listen, you young preachers, every message you ever preach, every word you ever say from the pulpit, and the reason behind what you say and how you say it, you will stand before a holy God one day and give an account for it. I, we were talking, every one of y'all, I guess, not, <clears throat> said something about being nervous. Let me help you. Don't ever get over it. Amen. Don't ever get over it. I heard, a, I heard this young preacher, I was in a meeting in North Carolina years ago, and this young preacher preached, and this older fellow got up and preached. And when we took a break, the young preacher went to the old one, and he said, when did you quit being nervous about preaching? The older fellow looked at him and said, Son, when I figure that out, I'll let you know. He'd been preaching for almost 60 years. And he meant it as a joke. But then he looked at him and he said, Let me tell you something. He said, When you quit being nervous about standing behind God's desk, you need to quit and get out of it. Because now you're doing it for yourself and not for him. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 when Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, I charge thee therefore before the pastor of Maryville Baptist Church, Jack Roberts. Huh? No, that ain't what he said. He said, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall do what? He shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. What scares me is not the preacher sitting in the pew. I understand as a young preacher sometimes that scares you because you think they're, you think they're smarter than you and, and think they're better preachers than you. I got news for you. I got a kick out of y'all this morning because I picked up about five messages. Don't come to my church and preach what you preach today because I'm going to use it. Most all of it. Don't look at me like that. Y'all are writing mine down right now so you can use it someplace else. I know what you're doing. What scares me what makes me nervous in the pulpit is the fact that one day I'm going to stand before my Savior and he's going to ask me, why did you preach that? Huh? Why did you preach that there? Is that what I told you to preach? You know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I heard you talking about it. You want to be nervous, young men, you be nervous because you're going to stand before a holy God and give an account for what he's called you to do and how you went about doing it. Lord. About four things. That's the introduction. That's just simply an introduction. I want to help you with a ministry that's worth having. A ministry that's worth something. It's all found, most of it's found right there where we read. I want you to notice, first of all, verse 5, Paul said, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. I tell you, if your ministry is ever going to amount to anything, you'll have to have an attitude of compassion. Somewhere along the lines in this day and age, Brother Wayne, all these preachers want to preach mad at everybody and think that's the way it's supposed to be. I'm not against telling folks the truth. But I'll tell you what Paul said in Ephesians 4.15, you're supposed to speak the truth in love. I'm going to tell you, I know preachers. I know a preacher. Him and I, were, we know him. And if I called his name, some of you others might, and I'm going to be nice today. I heard him preach twice. And that was more than enough. Because all he did both times he preached was brag about the different churches he'd taken over to pastor and how many folks he'd run off. Now, am I not telling the truth? You know who I'm talking about. Bragged about how many people he'd run off. Can I tell you what? God said to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 23, chapter, uh, chapter 23, verse 1, Woe unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep. Hey, it... it mm. You can't help folks if you don't care about them. They don't have to look like you. 
They don't have to dress like you. But I'm going to tell you, every person that walks the face of the earth has got a soul in them that's going to spend eternity in either heaven or hell someday. And how you treat them may, de may determine where they end up. My goodness. My wife and I, I, I hate them all. She's not here. You can tell her I said this because I've told her this. I hate to go shopping with her. I do. She's probably watching, but she's heard it before. My wife shops like this. She'll, she'll go in a clothing store. She'll pick, up, has, pick out a half a dozen outfits, go in the changing room. She'll bring two of them out and hang them, get, tell me to hold on to them. She'll go find, after a while, she'll find this one thing that she just has to have, right? This one dress. And because she carries four of them in there and can't get none of them to fit her right, she'll come out and put it on the rack and everything she's had me holding for an hour and a half, she puts it back on the rack and leaves the store. She's not going to buy that because she's mad at that. Four or, five, four or five years ago, she told me one day, she said, I'm going to the mall tomorrow and you're going to have to go with me because I won't nobody else go. And for you young preachers that just they ain't been married very long, you'll discover that when the wife says that after so long, you get in the car and keep your mouth shut. But we went, we went, to, the, we went to the Eastgate Mall in Knoxville. We're about an hour north of Knoxville. And it's a two-story mall. And we've been around every store in the top section. We've been around every store in the bottom section. She'd been in every shoe store and every clothing store was there, and still we didn't have nothing. But during the time we were going around in the stores, whatever, I'd get up close to somebody, close enough to speak, I'd reach in my pocket here, and I'd take out a track and say, here, won't you, won't you read this? I, I didn't give one to everybody, wasn't trying to track a bunch of folks down, just get close enough to, you know, just hand somebody a track. We got to the end of the mall, back to where we'd actually started, and there was one store, one shoe store she had not been in, and she just had to go in there. I was tired. I've got a bad knee, and I walk on concrete for long periods of time. It starts to hurt, and I, I found the bench. I sat down on it. I told her, I said, when you're done, we'll leave, but I'm not moving. You know, I'm, here I am. And so she went on towards the shoe store, and, and after, after all that time in the military, there's some things that I still do. One of them is I sit down someplace. First thing I do, start looking to see what's around me. I don't like people behind my back. It makes me uncomfortable. I didn't have any choice just to sit down there, and so I was, my head was kind of on a swivel. I turned to look down the hallway of the mall, and I caught this couple. All I caught was the back of them. Holding hands, they both had on blue jeans, white T-shirts. They was far enough away, it's about all I could tell. His hair is cut about like mine. She had a ponytail. Had her hair pulled back in a ponytail. It hung down to about her waist. And I just thought, well, I, you know, that's, that's nice. I didn't think much of it. And I sat there, and I, I just kind of sat there just watching. About 20 minutes or so, I happened to turn back this direction. Here they come. Now, I want you to listen. I'm not being ugly. I don't know any other way to describe it to make you understand. It was her hair cut like mine. She looked like she'd been in a paint factory when an explosion happened. Every part of her exposed skin had a tattoo on it, with the exception of right down the center of her face. I'm talking about around her ears, around her neck, up and down her arms. It was his hair pulled back in a ponytail hanging down to his waist. And he looked like he'd fell face first into a tackle box. Two or three piercings in each eyebrow, a couple in his top lip, one in his bottom lip, one in his chin, three or four earrings in each ear. And honestly, didn't intend to, but evidently I kind of recoiled when I saw him. Because as they were walking, he looked my direction about the time I went like this, and they kind of... <laughs> I mean, honestly, he, he kind of, he was the closest to me, and he kind of bumped her away as they walked around to get away from me. 
And I watched him walk by, watched him walk down the hallway towards the exit, thinking, why do people do that? be honest, like most independent fundamental Baptist pastors, I thought, I sure am glad they don't come to my church. And if I didn't step on your toes, come up here, I'm going to stomp them real good because there's something wrong with your feet. About 10 minutes, my wife come out of the shoe store she'd been in. And I was still sitting on that pew or bench. She got about 10, 15 foot from the door, and there come this lady out, and she had a kid in each hand, a little boy and a little girl. I don't know how old they were. She dressed real nice. I hopped up off that bench, and I was going over to get my wife, and I got over real close to her. Seen that lady behind her, and I went like this, and I thought, I need to give that woman a track. You know what I heard? It wasn't audible, Brother Caleb, but it just but he, he couldn't have shouted any louder. Why not then? We've come to the place nowadays that we think people have to look like us and dress like us. Hey, can I tell you something? The very people I let walk by me is the very people Jesus went after when he was here in his earthly ministry. When he, when he said, I must needs go through Samaria and went to the well, the woman standing there had been rejected by the religious leaders of her day. Hey, I know she's living in sin. She'd done been divorced five times and was living with somebody else's husband. But I tell you what, things changed after she met Jesus. Hey, you get into Mark chapter 5 and you find Jesus gets on a boat, crosses the sea, and he gets out, and this fellow comes running up to him that they've done pushed out into the cemetery and said, don't you come back. And you know what it says about verse 15? The town came out to see what happened, and he was clothed and in his right mind. You can't be a help to somebody until you start caring about them. Your ministry will never amount to anything, young men, if they don't have an attitude of compassion with it. I lay in, I, I'll be honest, I, I lay in bed at night before I go to sleep praying. And almost every night, that young couple that I let walk by me goes through my mind. And all I can do is say, God, don't let somebody else be like I was. Let somebody get the gospel to them. I'll probably never see them again. It probably won't matter how many times my wife makes me go to that mall. They'll probably never show back up. I miss my one opportunity. But God, don't let somebody else miss theirs. I got news for you. I don't care how big your crowd gets. I don't care who knows your name. I don't care how many people call you to come preach me. If you don't care about lost souls, get out of the ministry now and stay out of it. Now, I'm not trying to be mean to you young men, but I'm going to tell you, there's enough nonsense goes on in churches without folks piling on. First of all, Paul said you need an attitude of compassion. You need an approach that's consistent. Look what he says in the rest of verse 5. You have a good conscience and of a faith unfeigned book of Galatians chapter 2 Paul let me get over there so I can read it I messed stuff up when I try to quote it verse 11 says but when Peter was come to Antioch I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed for before that certain came from James he did eat with the Gentiles but when they were come he withdrew and separated himself fearing them which are of the circumcision and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest, at, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? I tell you, one of the worst things in the world, it hurts the gospel folks that won't stand someplace and stay there. I, I mentioned the fella. I'm not calling his name, but I tell you he was my favorite preacher in all the world. I would. I'd drive anywhere. If I could get there, I'd go listen to him preach. 
but he's, his comment <coughs> was he could get a bigger crowd and a bigger offering if he used the NIV, so, and I won't walk across the street to hear him. I'm going to tell you something. You better be careful. People are watching you. I don't care whether you're a pastor in a church or whether you're just getting started. I got news for you. If you've told folks you're a preacher, they got their eyeballs on you. And there's enough goes on in the ministry that makes it hard without other folks just coming along and making it harder. I hope I don't make any of you mad, but I'll, I'm going to tell you this. It'll cost you some friends. I believe the Bible says what it means and it means what it says. When you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 in the book of Titus, there's some qualifications for being the pastor of a church. Been about four years ago, I guess. Three anyway. One of the best friends I had, him and I parted ways. You see, the first qualification of a pastor is that you be the husband of one wife. Now you can amen or oh my, the Bible says what it says. That does not say one wife at a time, it says one wife. Him and I had been friends for years. Him and his wife divorced. He got remarried. Still standing in the same pulpit. The day he called me and told me, I said, you know how I stand on that, and I'll not be back out at your church. Four years ago, I, I got invited to a meeting. I'm going to tell it. I, I'm not proud. I'm, I'm not bragging. Listen, what I'm about to tell you, I'm not bragging, but I'm not ashamed of what I did either. I caught in the same position. I'll do it again. I got invited to a meeting. I went and sat down, and the first preacher called to the pulpit the very first night of the meeting was him. See, the thing was, this discussion had been had in my church on Wednesday nights in our Bible study, and I had been asked by the people in my church, put in that position, preacher, what would you do? You know what I told them? I said I'd get up and walk out. So when they called him to the pulpit, what do you think I did? I used to say, now listen to me. I had paid for my motel room. Didn't cost that church nothing. Matter of fact, I paid for two nights because I wasn't coming home till Wednesday morning. We got up Tuesday morning. I left. We went back to the motel. Went and got something to eat. Went back to the motel. My wife was with me. I got up Tuesday and drove home. I got home at about 12 o'clock on Tuesday. And I want you to know something. One o'clock Tuesday afternoon, my phone started ringing. The people in my church, and I hadn't said a word to anybody. Matter of fact, this is the first time I've spoke about it. People in my church were calling me because word had done got back to my people. And I figured half of them would leave because they know him. And I had at least three families say, we're glad that you'll at least do what you say you'll do. And take a stand where you say you're going to stand. And listen to me. You better make up your mind what you believe and what you stand for. Because I'm going to tell you, the devil will do his best to make you back up. So somebody can say, well, he don't believe that anyway. So what difference does it make? Your approach to things must be consistent. Even when it costs you. even when it cost you a friend. He called me. I can tell you it cost me a friendship because he told me on the phone. Matter of fact, what he told me on the phone was we're done. And he said, I'll do my best to ruin you in this county. <coughs> be real careful, boys. Better be careful what you say. You better be willing to back up what you say.
because sooner or later you're going to be put to the test. I'm not here to impress you. I'm going back to my church in the morning. It ain't a fourth this size. I'll preach harder at them in the morning than I'm preaching to you this afternoon, so just you'll be all right in a few minutes. You must have an attitude of compassion. You must have an approach that's consistent. You need to affirm constantly the doctrines of the Word of God. Listen, I can't speak for where you're at, where your particular church is, or where you go, but listen, the biggest problems I got down there where I live is half the people sitting in the pews of the Baptist church think they're going to heaven because they shook some preacher's hand and repeated some prayer. I know this to be a fact because as quick as it gets warm enough, well, it's now getting warm enough as quick as I can, we can find a Sunday night to do it. I got four of them to baptize. A 38-year-old man 18 year old girl a 12 year old girl and a 14 year old boy and every one of them's told me I thought I saved because I went to the altar and they told me if I wanted to go to heaven all I had to do was repeat this prayer can I tell you something the Bible says that it takes repentance and faith by the way faith without repentance will not get you to heaven by the way you know what most people think repentance is Saying I'm sorry after they get caught. Repentance is not being sorry for the consequences of what you've done. It's being sorry for the conduct that caused the consequences. That makes sense to you this afternoon? Hey, Jesus himself said in Luke chapter 13 verses 3 and 5, speaking to religious people, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Lady came to our church for almost six months, Brother Josh. We've only got three row of pews. She sat about the fifth row back right over there for Sunday school and church every Sunday morning. And at the time, I didn't have enough people. I was having to teach our teenage class during Sunday school. Brother Bird, he says he's not called to preach, but I'll tell you, he does much preaching when he's teaching. About any preacher I've ever met knows of you, been around him, knows what I'm talking about. I come upstairs from Sunday school one Sunday morning. He's standing back there with that lady, and she just a bolt. And I, as I do, I, I came up, did a few things up front, and I started down through there, and I was going to speak to her. And when I got there, I noticed she was crying, he's a talking. And I thought the best thing for me to do, I went off the back corner back there and started praying. I just decided I'd stay out of it. Church went on. It was over. She walked out the door, shook hands with me. I called him on the way out, and I said, what's going on? He said, she's lost. And I said, well, did she get in the home? She would, wouldn't do it. Didn't show up for about three weeks. So one Saturday on visitation, my wife and I were out together. We went by our house. Knocked on the door. She came to the door, and she said, well, hello, preacher. She said, I got company today. Come back some other time. Just almost slammed the door in my face. I'm used to that. A few more weeks went by, and she still hadn't come back. Me and Brother Bird was out one Saturday, and we'd visited several folks. He brought up, he, he mentioned her. And I looked at my watch, and I said, I ain't doing nothing. It's Saturday. I ain't doing nothing until tomorrow morning anyway, so over there we went. Knocked on the door, and she came to the door. She let us in. Was down the living room with her. Started talking to her. This is what she told me. She looked me dead in the eye. She said, Preacher, when I was 12 years old, I went to a tent revival with my cousin. She said at invitation time, my cousin popped up. Down the aisle she went. She said, I thought I'd go too. She said, I never heard a word the preacher said. Wasn't really interested. I was just there because my cousin was. She said, I got down front, and this fellow grabbed my hand, took me off to the side, opened his Bible up, and said two or three things, and she said, I remember more than anything. He asked me, uh, uh, did I want to go to heaven? And I told him, I sure. He said, well, if you'll just repeat the sinner's prayer. By the way, would somebody please open your Bible and show me where that's at? 
Now, now, if you want to talk about the thief on the cross, we'll talk about a sinner's prayer. But what these people are being told to repeat, you won't find anywhere in the 66 books of the King James Bible. But what she told me was, I repeated that prayer. She said, I went back to church with my mom on Sunday. And they announced that I, by the way, she said, he told everybody I got saved in the tent that night. And when I went to church with my mom on Sunday, the preacher got me up front and he told everybody I got saved. They dunked me in the baptistry. And for 30-something years, everybody thought I saved because of what those two preachers told everybody. And she said, I'd be ashamed to get saved and have to tell everybody it was a lie all this time. She will not come. Matter of fact, the last time I went by to see her, she came to the door. Brother Bird can tell you this. She said, I'm not coming back, and I wish y'all would go away and leave me alone. Now listen to me. If all you're interested in is putting a bunch of notches on your belt, go around and tell folks to repeat some prayer. But when you stand before God, you're going to give an account from whether or not you told them what salvation is. They may not be getting saved by the thousands nowadays, but I'll tell you what, the ones that's at my church, go through my church, I can tell you this, they know what the plan of salvation is, even if I make them mad while I'm doing it. You're going to stand before God. I look around, I see several of you. Some pastoring churches, some just getting started. You're going to stand before God one day and give an account for the ministry He gives you and how you conduct it. If you want to make it worth something, follow Paul's outline to a young preacher named Timothy. It don't matter if the world thinks you're nothing. The world's not going to be my judge anyway, Brother Simpson. Lastly, you'll not find it there. You'll find it in the book of Jude, verse 3. Jude wrote that you <coughs> always contend for the faith. That was once delivered to the saints. Earnestly is the word he used. You know what the word contend means, right? That you fight with those who are against you. We've got too much compromise in the day and age in which we live. We've got too many folks worried too much about how many friends they'll make or how many friends they'll lose. That even... Listen to me, even when they all turn you back and walk away, can I remind you the Bible says there is a friend. That stick is closer to the brother. Now just be honest. I'd rather have him than most of my so-called friends anyway. If the Bible's correct, somewhere between 12 and 22 years is about all I got left. Three score and 10, or if by strength of days, four score, meaning between 70 and 80 years old. About all, I'm, I'm 58 years old. Somewhere between 12 and 22 years. Maybe I get lucky and live a little longer than that, but some of the aches and pains, I'm not sure I want to. Some of these other fellows be gone before I am. What's left behind to tell the folks who are here? And a great grandson back there, four months old. Four months old. I might get to stay, I might get to live till he turns 18. Maybe. I still hope I'm around Brother Simpson when he gets old enough that God deals with him about his soul. But I'd sure like to leave this world knowing that he's coming where I'm going. But if not, listen to me, if not, I hope they still some preachers that got a ministry worth having. Wesley, I'm done.